Jesus loves the church. We know that's true. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Right. It's the focus of our study for this winter and spring. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, we learned this last week that the book of Revelation isn't complicated or difficult to understand. Say, what do you mean? It comes with a divine outline. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, let me read it to you. It says, write down the things that you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. This is the three-part outline of the book of Revelation. Chapter 1 are the things that John saw. So in some ways, you should be excited. We are already done with part one of Revelation. That's awesome. This morning, we'll step into part two, the things that are. Revelation chapter two and Revelation chapter three is that section of the book. And then the, four, the third and final section of the book starts in chapter four all the way through chapter 22, where it's the things that will happen. And Lord willing, we plan to begin that study this fall. But in chapters one through five, we'll see Jesus's love. His love, his tenderness, and his toughness revealed to the church. Sometimes love necessitates endurance, toughness, saying hard things. Sometimes it requires tenderness and care. And in these two chapters, you're going to see, what does it mean that God actually loves me? What does that look like as his person, one that belongs to him? Revelation 2 and 3 puts it in black and white and most in red so that you really get it. This is what his love looks like. It's revealed. That's a super important word for us in our study of the book of Revelation. Revelation simply means the unveiling or revealing to uncover or to manifest. And revelation is the revelation. Well, let's look at verse one of chapter one. I love what it says. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ, the New Living Translation says, which God gave to him to show his servants the events that must take place soon. The old King Jimmy, the old King James puts it this way. This is the revelation of Jesus. See, in chapter 1, verse 1, you get very clearly the intent of this book. This book is to show you who Jesus is in all of his glory and the things that will soon take place. Listen to me. Let me have your attention. In that priority, this book is about Jesus and the things that are about to take place. See, the book of Revelation is given to prepare us, not to scare us. God doesn't seek to conceal things from us, but to reveal them to us. And you must, must, must approach an apocalyptic, a prophetic book in this way. Prophecy isn't given to overstimulate our brains, but to motivate our hearts and our hands to worship. Worship. And last thing I would say, the book of Revelation brings sense to the suffering that we experience. I mean, think about what this week would be like for you if you didn't know Jesus and you saw that Russia is moving into the Ukraine. You'd say, oh my goodness, when do we still say that? But there would be this element of freak out because it looks like everything is unraveling, falling out of place. Yet the book of Revelation shares and shows to us that, wait a second, God has a plan, and that plan is falling into place, so trust him. Does that mean that life for a Christian in America will always be roses and rainbows? No. Where is that in the book of Revelation? It's not there. Roses and rainbows, that's called heaven, and that's coming for you. 
May that give your heart resiliency, not the status of your 401k or the ever-fluctuating gas prices, right? Don't let that give you what you need. In Revelation, we are given a full understanding of who Jesus is. And this morning, we'll step into the second chapter of the book and kind of consider the first of seven postcards, messages, letters that Jesus shares with his church. So let's jump in. I'd like to read verses 1 through 7 of Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to read the text in its entirety from the New Living Translation. If you're still awake these five minutes in, let me know by saying, Jesus loves church. Jesus loves church. Okay, verse 1, chapter 2 in your Bibles. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. Wow. I know all the things you do. I've seen your hard work. I've seen your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You've examined the claims of those who say they're apostles but are not. You've discovered that they are liars. You've patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look at how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans, just as I do. And anyone who hears, has ears to hear, must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life. In the paradise of God. When studying scripture, I want to encourage you to step into the text with these three S's in mind. Setting, saying, and so what? What do you mean by that? Setting, the background information, the type of literature that you're reading, what genre is this? Is this a historical book? Is this narrative? Is this a book of poetry? Is this a book of prophecy? Setting, pertinent content and context that illuminates the intent of the text. The setting, get to know the setting of the text that you're in. The second thing though is saying. What is the text saying about the most central person in scripture? Me, 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 me. No, 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 no. That's not how we look into God's word. What is this text saying about God and his plans and his agenda? And then the so what is basically this. How does my life fall into alignment with that? The wrong question will always be, God, what's your will for my life? The wrong question. The right question is, God, what is your will, and how does my life see that it's done? That's the right question. Now you're on the right path. You're no longer in this world of an egocentric Christianity, which is a contradiction in terms, but you're living a Christocentric life. Jesus, you're in the center. What you say goes. The great thing about that, once you decide to do that, you never have to renew that commitment again. No. No. In the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul says that we as believers are like living sacrifices. And growing up in a church, I always heard this joke from guest teachers or teachers at my high school. They'd say, you know the problem with the living sacrifice is it likes to crawl off the altar. It's like, that's true. Like all of us are like, Lord, I need you to be center, and I need to say that every single morning. It's not something you just say, well, I got baptized, I said it. Now I'm doing what I want to do. And how does the Bible support what I want to do? That is the pathway to error and to a fruitless life. Consider with me a few things about the setting of the text that we just read. 
You see, in chapters two and three, we see seven letters, messages to seven churches. And listen, this is gonna be a little bit more instructional than motivational. Are you okay with that? Like, I'm not gonna jump up and down. I don't have any bunny rabbits or stories of young kids to show you. I'm just gonna share four things that relate to the setting so that you better understand what this means. Is that okay with you guys as Coastline Gulf Breeze? Okay, here it is. It's not like flashy. It's not like fun, doesn't even rhyme, but it's instructional. That's good? Okay, here we go. Here's the first thing. These were seven actual churches in modern-day Turkey that existed in John's day. John was on the island of Patmos, one of the several islands in the Aegean Sea. And when you think of Patmos, think of Alcatraz, not Tahiti, Nassau, or Maui. That's not the kind of island that they put old John on. Patmos was located south of Ephesus. This first letter, who it's written to. It was the closest city on the mainland to Patmos. Now, Ephesus was a famous city. And it was a famous city with a well-known church. They had superstars there. What do you mean by that? You ever heard of the Apostle Paul? He lived there for three years and helped pastor the church. Can you imagine, like, well, who's teaching today? Ah, there's this guy. His name's the Apostle Paul. God's using him to write the Bible. You should come hear what he has to say. Like, that's a good church. Aquila and Priscilla and Apollos served there. Big names in the early church, Acts 18. Timothy. Not only was Paul there, but Paul's protege served as the pastor of the church for a season. And even John. John, the last living disciple. The one who had so much resiliency and love for God that they dipped him in hot, boiling oil to kill him for his faith in Christ, and he came out smiling. Ephesus had a well-known and established and solid church, superstars. Ephesus was situated next to the main harbor and was known as the gateway to Asia. Ephesus was world famous for its cultural, economic, and even somewhat religious center of that region. One of the ancient seven wonders of the world, the Temple of Diana, with 127 60-foot tall pillars adorned with sculptures was in Ephesus. And Diana was the fertility goddess that was worshipped with immoral sex. Another author says the temple of Artemis was also a major treasury and bank of the ancient world where merchants and kings and even cities made deposits where their money could be kept safe. Ephesus was a stronghold of Satan, one author wrote. Here many evil things, both superstitious and satanic, were practiced. Books containing formula for sorcery and other ungodly forbidden arts were plentiful in that city. What does this mean? The Christians in Ephesus, they weren't in the Bible Belt. It wasn't about sweet tea, football, and just kind of snoozing through a sermon for them. Like culture was gnarly. It was hard. It was difficult. And Ephesus was famous. The Roman postal circuit of that day would travel north from Ephesus to Smyrna to Pergamos, east to Thyatira, then south to Sardis, southeast to Philadelphia, and finally to Laodicea. These are the names of the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. And these are the seven cities that were all within 50 miles from each other. Here's the first thing to take note of. The book of Revelation isn't all symbols. It isn't all just open to your interpretation. These were real congregations in real cities that Jesus had a real message for in that time. This is real, not just fairy tale. Second thing to note, there were many other churches in this area at that time. It's not like there were only seven. You ever heard of a book called Colossians? Okay, front row, a couple people. Yeah, this girl says absolutely. There was a church there in the area of Colossae. 
but nothing's written to them at this stage. Why? Well, numbers carry significance in Scripture. Seven is the number of fullness, perfection, completion. And here's the second thing we see this morning concerning the setting of our text. In this section, these two chapters, we have a full picture of what Jesus wants to know, what Jesus wants the church to know concerning his heart for them. Some would say these seven churches give a picture of the last 2,000 years of church history. That theory or perspective seems to hold true as you consider the, I don't know, how church history unfolds over the last 2,000 years. But here's the point, the second point. These letters, they show and share what it looks like to be loved by Jesus as the church. Because that can be kind of murky sometimes, right? Well, gosh, Jesus loves the church, so I should just kind of live any way I want. Have you read Revelation 2 and 3? This is what love looks like. Number three, the words of Jesus are universal and personal. What do you mean by that? One author says this, nearly every challenge facing today's church, it's addressed in these, these letters. And every believer belongs to one of these seven churches, spiritually speaking. There's a personal application for all of us. And he, he says this, this author, I so appreciated this. He says, most of us are interested in what Revelation has to say about the future. But first, God wants to speak to us about our current relationship with him. Don't miss this as we consider these seven churches. The book of Revelation, first and foremost, is a revealing of who? Jesus. And does Jesus care anything for the church? Absolutely. He loves the church. He loves the church. So before there's this unveiling, this unraveling, this description of things that are to come, Jesus wants you to know what you mean to him. Fourth and finally, the structure or the format and how Jesus speaks to each of the churches follows a similar pattern. Now, I lied to you. I said in this like informational setting, there'd be no like rhyme or alliteration. Well, if you're a note taker, there's actually seven C's in the way in which the text unfolds in every single letter. Here it is. Church, characterization, commendation, critique and complaint, command, counsel and caution, and comfort. Did you get all that? You can't leave the room if you can't repeat that. Here's what I'm saying. The structure in which Jesus communicates to the church is consistent. Let me see your eyes. God plays no favorites. You need to know that. Because sometimes you can look at a person or a church and go, gosh, it just seems like that family has no struggles. Why is God so good to them? It just seems like in that area, ministry is just firing. Jesus talks to the churches in the same way, same format, where he identifies the city where the church resides. That's number one. Characterization, he gives a pertinent description of who he is attached to the message he's about to share. That's number two. Commendation, he gives encouragement to what they're doing well, and then he gives critique or complaint with a command, counsel and caution, and then he ends with comfort. Now, in some of these churches, these elements of the message is blurred and varied, but also this is just good advice in how to navigate challenging information to anyone. When I had the opportunity to live and serve in the city of Destin and plant a church there, we had a, a small staff, sometimes between five and eight people. And anytime we'd be in a staff meeting, staff members used to say, Neil always makes a sandwich when he communicates to us. Do you know what this means? Make a sandwich. There's positive, the point, and then the positive. Does that make sense? Like that just helps the, the point go down easier. Like this is a good example of how to communicate. Like if you have a challenge with a spouse, you don't start out and say, you always and you never. No, 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 no. Let's calm down. Remember, this person chose to marry you. This is like a volitional thing. You could be alone. Maybe you deserve to be. But like <laughs> just recognize the context of the relationship. 
There's got to be something encouraging. Have the right perspective and then share the challenge. And don't ever or always or never use the words always and never. Does that make sense? Like this is free advice. This isn't going to charge you to leave. But this is the way Jesus communicates. It's very effective. Build a sandwich. It's the way to do it. Okay. Four things to take note of concerning our text. Number one, seven messages to seven churches who actually existed. The Bible is not a book of fairy tales. It is rooted in historical events. Why is that important? Because if it's not, then it is just fluff. Then you should be freaked out by what's happening this week. If this isn't real, if this isn't rooted in that which you can go over to those areas and dig in the dirt and see, yeah, that's what it is, then the spiritual connotations of this book are flat. They don't exist. Paul used to say this, that if Christ is not risen, meaning physically, bodily, rose from the dead, Christians are of all people to be most pitied. You know why? Because we don't live to get ours on this side of eternity. We live for a kingdom that's not yet here. The decisions we make aren't based on the bottom line of what gives us the most money, what gives us the most free time, what allows us to live an egocentric life. That's not how we live. We live in a way where we say, Christ, you're king. How can my talents, how can my gifts, how can my resources see what you want done, done? That's a foolish way to live if there's no heaven. If this, all, if this is all there is, then man, be egocentric, right? Right? You get yours, but if it's not, the wisest thing you could do is don't live for that which is going to perish. You know this, ROI. Don't you want it? The greatest return on investment? It's not here. You keep doing that, you're going to regret it. Invest where it matters, and where it matters is eternity. And this is what Jesus has to share with so many of the churches. Don't lose perspective. Don't lose perspective. These are real churches. The letters give clarity to the kind of love that he has for his church. And let me just share this with you. His love is comforting and commending, but there's also warning and critiquing and caution. These letters are universal. They apply to the church for thousands of years. And listen, let me see your eyes. It applies to you today. And fourth and finally, they all follow a similar pattern. Jesus is consistent. So much in life is not. Things don't work. People don't follow through. That's not Jesus. Jesus is consistent. I can trust him. Now that we've already preached that sermon, let's get into the sermon for today, okay? Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. We won't consider all points of those contexts for every letter, but you needed to know that as we consider every letter. So if you're still awake, let me know by saying, Jesus loves church. church. Okay, thank you, Jesus. So here is verses 1 through 7 of Revelation chapter 2. You could say the Ephesian church grew calloused because they were careless. That's the church of Ephesus. In verse 1, we see parts 1 and 2 of this seven-point outline and how Jesus approaches the church. We see the church identified and an interesting character description of Jesus. Look at verse 1 again with me of Revelation chapter 2. He says, write this letter to the angel in the church of Ephesus. See, there it is, point 1. He just identified where this church is. Number two, this is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. This is an interesting characteristic description of Jesus. You don't see this when he's walking in Galilee or in Capernaum. This is a different aspect of Jesus that's being revealed to us. Now, we've considered the culture of the Christians in Ephesus. We don't need to go back there and unpack all of what's going on in Ephesus. Here's what you need to know. It's a worldly place. That's what's going on in Ephesus. In 
And it opens, verse 1 of chapter 2, to write this letter to the angel of the church. The New Testament wasn't written in Ebonics or Southern English. It was written in Koine Greek. A bit of it was written in Aramaic, but the New Testament Greek word for angel simply means messenger. So there's two schools of thought on what this means. Option one, there is a literal guardian angel assigned to every church. That's what this could mean. Or that this letter is addressed to a messenger of the local church. That's possible. This isn't a critical issue on where you land, but nowhere else in scripture are angels seen as being in the right hand of Jesus. And you may say, how do you know that the messengers are those seven stars in the right hand of Jesus? Well, the best commentary on the Bible is what, church? It rhymes with Bible and starts with a B. The Bible. Look at chapter 1, verse 20. We know what these stars are. It says, this is the meaning of the mystery of the seven stars. Oh, there it is. The answers are in the back of the book. You saw in my right hand the the seven gold lampstands. These seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So these stars are the messengers. Nowhere in Scripture do you see angels treated with this kind of It's kind of dynamic. You see, Jesus loves the church. And he holds the stars in his right hand. You ever been hurt by a pastor? Disappointed? Frustrated? That that leader still gets to lead even though you may know something about that leader? Jesus holds the stars in his right hand. He knows. He knows. You know the interesting thing about the stars, if you were outside yesterday, you don't see them when the sun is out. Like when the sun is brightly shining like it's supposed to, who kind of gives a rip about the stars? Does that make sense? Like you don't see them. You see the sun. That's what stars are supposed to do. The stars of the church are not superstars unlike our culture today. See, I'm of the opinion, and it's just an opinion. You have every right to be wrong and not agree with my opinion. But I think that the word messenger (laughs) means like the messenger, the pastor of the church. You don't know what it's like to be the pastor of a church until you are one. We don't sign up to be pastors of churches because it's fun. There is a great fun to it. It's because it's what we're told to do. It's not like you go, well, what should I do? Should I be a surfboard shaper, an ice cream maker, or maybe a pastor? seems like they just work on Sunday, so that's what I'll do. No. (laughs) To serve in pastoral ministry, I love the way Chuck Smith, when he taught my men's discipleship class, my last semester of Bible college, and I'll never forget him saying this, if you can do anything else, go and do it. But if you must be a pastor then do anything you can to support that habit. So I'm putting it in the NIV, Neil's interesting version. But this is basically what he said. God must call you to this. Because that's the only thing that gives you endurance. You know, I haven't been pastoring nearly as long as my father. But I have been around pastoral ministry my whole life. I've seen many pastors come and go. Some like, like superstar, like, whoa. And then, whoa, where'd they go? You know, like, I'm thankful for guys like my dad. Consistent, dependable, predictable. What do you mean by that? He's going to teach the Bible. I'm thankful that Jesus loves the church, that he's walking among the seven gold lampstands. You know what that means? Jesus goes to church. Why don't you? You think you're better than Jesus? Like he's there. He's walking out. He's hanging out with the churches. One author puts it this way. Some professing Christians claim they don't need to go to church. Simply put, you cannot say yes to Jesus and say no to the church. It was Jesus himself who established the church and how you treat the church shows how you treat Jesus because Jesus is the head of the church. And if your faith doesn't take you to church, 
you need to seriously consider whether it'll take you to heaven. I was like, ooh, that's powerful. But that's true. We love church because that's what Jesus loves. It's not because it's always the most fun thing or most convenient thing to do. It comes from a place of surrender. See, this is points one and two. If you're following that seven-point outline of how Jesus speaks to the church, we see the location of the church. We see this characteristic of the church. Jesus is walking amongst the churches, even the ones that you disagree with, even the ones that you don't like, even the ones that you think they're not faithful. Jesus loves the church. Let him be the one who holds them in his hand. Instead of picking on, pick from. Say, this is what I do see that they're doing well, and I'm going to trust Jesus with the rest. In verses 2 and 3 and verse 6, we see a commendation from Jesus. Look at verses 2 and 3 and verse 6. He says, I know all the things you do. I've seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know that you don't tolerate evil people, that you've examined the claims of those who said that they're apostles and not. You've discovered that they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. And then in verse 6, and this is in your favor, you hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans just as I do. Man, if you were to show up like first Sunday at a church and it's the Ephesus church, not only is the teaching roster like better than ever, like Paul and John and Timothy, and it's like, good Lord, could there ever be a, this is the team. It's an active church, insightful, studious, hardworking, patient, fought for doctrinal purity, discerning, tenacious. They know how to endure. When it's talking about the Nicolaitans, who are they? Church history isn't 100% sure, but Irenaeus, who wrote in the second century, he wrote this about the Nicolaitans, that they are followers of that Nicholas, who is one of the first seven deacons ordained by the apostles. They lead lives of unrestrained indulgence. Church history shows us that one of those seven deacons, Nicholas, kind of went off into lasciviousness. Not everyone you lay hands on in a church ends up following through. But also, the word Nicolaitan means to conquer the people. See, whether this Nicolaitan group were a group of people that just lived the way they wanted to, just followed the appetites of their flesh, or they were those that put people down, suppressed them. Like, they're super interested in the flow chart of who, where the pecking order is, right? Like, well, I'm your boss, aren't I, or aren't I? They said they hate that. The foot of the cross is level. Does that make sense? Like, I have no greater access to God than you do, and you don't come to me to get to know God. You come to this guy named Jesus. He's the mediator between God and man. Pastors are just here to help, like to serve, hopefully to shield you from certain things or to help navigate certain things. But believe it or not, we're still human. Our hair is probably going to fall out. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, we still navigate the same things you navigate. And this is what Jesus said to this church. I love you guys. You don't put people down. You're not living for the flesh. You're fighting for doctrinal purity. He says you get four gold stars, servants, sacrificial, steadfast, and you stayed separated from the world. Listen, these are good and admirable qualities. You know the story of Martha and Mary? Everyone ever heard that once or twice? Like if Martha were here, she'd be doing this like the slow clap to the Ephesian church. But that's my people, hardworking. But look at verse four. Jesus offers a critique and a complaint for this church. He says, I have this complaint against you. Listen to this. This is weighty. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Motion without the proper motive is wrong. 1 Corinthians 13, if I had more time, I'd read the first three verses to you. But you could be the superstar, and without love, you're just like a clanging cymbal or a barking puppy dog every two hours throughout the night. Like, Oh, this is not good. We just got a dog two days ago. This is our life right now. That's why you may not understand that situation. But 
He's 11 weeks, and he loves to not sleep at when he's supposed to and loves to sleep when he's not supposed to. But anyway, that's what it's like. Like, burr, burr, burr. like that's, oh, come on. Like, that's someone who's got performance without passion for God and passion for people. Just a turn off. Matthew 22, when Jesus was asked, what is priority in life? You know what he said? Performance. Status. Salary. No, he said, a love for God and a love for people. He said, you could take everything the Old Testament, the prophets have to say, and like hang them on those two things. That's what this is. It's a love for God and a love for people. Let me read this to you from Warren Wearsby. He said this, what we do know, what we do for the Lord is important, but so is why we do it. What is this first love? It is the devotion to Christ that so often characterizes a new believer. Fervent, personal, uninhibited, excited, openly displayed. It's the honeymoon love of the husband and wife. And you say, what do you mean? That I need to put on a plastic smile every time I come to Jesus? Oh, it's all great. We're in that honeymoon, 40 years in. Like, it's awesome. Is that what this is? Listen, I love what Wearsby says. He says, while it is true that mature married love deepens and grows richer, it is also true that it should never lose the excitement and wonder of those honeymoon days. When a husband and wife begin to take each other for granted and life becomes routine, then the marriage is in danger. Just think of it. It is possible to serve and sacrifice and suffer for my name's sake and not really love Jesus. The Ephesian believers were so busy maintaining their separation that they were neglecting their adoration. Labor is no substitute for love. Neither is purity a substitute for passion. The church must have both if it's to please him. I appreciate those words from Warren Wearsby. Many of our modern English translations translate this section as that the Ephesians had left their first love, not lost it. What does that mean? It means it happens over time. It's a slow fade. You grow calloused. Why? Because you're human. Can I say this? Here's the natural thing of all things. To lose its cool. For the alignment of the automobile to go out of alignment. That's what happens. To drift towards carelessness, not carefulness. It's a supernatural thing for it to be the opposite. See, it's allowing things, especially your walk with Jesus, to move from a renewed state to routine, then to rut, then eventually to rot. That is the natural way. Aren't you glad you came to church today? That's what's going to happen if you just kind of put it on autopilot. I'm just going to phone it in, in my marriage, in my parenting, in my business, in my pool chemicals. Good luck with that. That doesn't work in Northwest Florida. You've got to maintain it can't live that way. You're called to live on purpose because everyone ends up somewhere in life, but very few people do it on purpose. You're called to live intentionally, walk circumspectly. Jesus did not die for you to be religious about him, but in relationship with him. He wants your heart. I want to encourage you to read the book of Jeremiah. He's known as the weeping prophet. You know why? No no converts in Jeremiah's ministry. In Jeremiah chapter 2, it's like you see the broken heart of God. Specifically verses 1 and 2 where he's like, I remember the days when it was like, when it was us. When you loved me. When you were thankful that I died for you. The life that I'd given to you. I miss that. So what does he say to do? Look at verses Well, verse 5, we'll see points 5 and 6 of this way that Jesus approaches the church. We see a command and counsel and caution given. Verse 5, he says, look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, 
I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. Here's the equation of Jesus. Remember, repent, repeat, or be removed. So, whoa, that's gnarly. What do you mean by that? Unpack that. Well, let's, let's unpack it. You see, the righteous brothers happens to all of us, right? You've lost that love and feeling. You know that song? You know Top Gun? That happens to all of us. That's the way life goes. The nature of things is for things to drift, to cool, to be careless. Everything worth having in life needs both nurture and care. And the equation to remember is rep remember, repent, and repeat. Warren Wearsby says that this word remember literally means keep on remembering. David Guzik said when the prodigal son was in the pig pen, his first step in restoration was to remember what life was like with his father. Be reminded of how good God is. That's part of why we gather together as a church. One of the people that mentored me said, Neil, do you know the purpose of a Sunday morning? In many ways, it's to gather with people just to say thank you to God, to sing to him, to give to him, to do what he likes. He likes us to hang out. Man, I love it when my six kids get along. I love that. He likes that. We hear his word taught because we're knowing more about him. I love it when my kids ask me about different seasons in my life. Dad, tell me what it was like to live in this place or have 12 roommates over here. Like, I like that. I like them knowing me. Does that make sense? In many ways, the reason we gather, just do this simple thing in your life. Go to church on Sunday. Have your heart open. It will help keep your heart in that right place of remembering who Jesus is. I have an uncle who passed away almost 10 or 11 years ago. And I remember walking with him on a beach in Encinitas when I was in Bible college. Because I don't, you know, you don't have any money when you're in college. I don't have any money now. But like, then I didn't have any either. But like, I remember going there because he was in town. I was like, oh, I can do my laundry there and I can get some meals and I'm just, I'll hang out with him. And I'll, I'll never forget. He said, you know, one of the things I made as a habit in my life, Neil, was to, no matter where I am in the world, I'm in church on a Sunday. Well, that's a good habit. It's a good thing to model to your kids. Be reminded of how good God is. Number two, repent. What does that mean? Start do, 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 do. No, your works, if you do, 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 smell like do, do to everybody, especially to God. Like your righteous works, they don't, like that's not the jam. What is, is the right way of thinking. Repentance is first and foremost a change of mind. God, what you say is what I say. If you call this sin, so do I. If you call this good, so do I. And then repeat the first works. You don't ever graduate from Christianity 101. Tell someone about Jesus this week. That's what you used to do when you first got, man, tell somebody. Read the Bible in a way where you're excited to find out. You know, there's this church that puts out this program five days a week. You ever heard of this church? It's called Daily in the Word. Get Daily in the Word. Like there's a reading plan, there's a video devotional. Study God's word. Pray. Give. Give. Do you know who David is of the Old Testament? Anyone over here? Anyone over here? You ever heard of David? Do you know what he said one time about giving something to God when he was the king? Someone wanted to give him a field so that he could give it over to God. And he goes, No, 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 no. I'm not going to give to God that which costs me nothing. I want to pay for this. Like a sacrifice isn't a sacrifice unless it's a sacrifice. Does that make sense? Like, and that's how we give. We don't give foolishly, but we give where we go, oh, well, that means no extra vanilla in that latte this week because I'm given to this situation or that situation. Like, Because here's the deal. This is the, God doesn't need your money. He wants your heart to be free. And where you give is where your heart goes. That's the equation. God doesn't need your money. Newsflash, God doesn't need you. He wants you. That's a healthy relationship. He wants you. He wants you. He wants you to live free. So give, actually serve. Serve. 
Like, have a start date and end date. I think those are helpful. Like, how long am I going to be serving in the three-year-old class? Like, I need an end date. That's no problem. You can have an end date. But serve. It's, a, it's like oxygen to a healthy faith. Faith is like a muscle. Use it or lose it, bro. Serve, give, learn, sing, pray. When communion is happening, wake up, pay attention. This is what this is about. This is supposed to be a three-dimensional worship experience that reminds you of how good God is. Greg Laurie said this, the secret to the Christian life is long obedience in the same direction. I love that because that's a sting on Frederick Nietzsche if you don't know what that is. But, but if you want a healthy relationship with God, you have to get up every single day and read your Bible, be an active part of the church, and you need to have a prayer life. I like how simple that is. The secret to the Christian life is long obedience in the same direction. Martin Luther once said this, there are two days on my calendar this day and that day. So what does that mean? I never met Martin. I don't know. But when I meet him, I'll ask him. But here's what I think it means. Today's got enough trouble of its own. I can't be worried about what happened yesterday or what might happen tomorrow. I got six kids, a puppy, and a bunny in our house. That's enough trouble for today. You know, like, good Lord, I got to focus where I am or I'm going to die. Like, I'm right here. But I also want to live this day in light of that day. What's that day? I think it's the day that Jesus returns. But it also could mean, remember that day? When you finally came home to Jesus. Remember that day. Two days on my calendar, man. Today and that day. Then you'll lead a good life. Why does that matter? Because you know what he says. If you don't, here's the warning. You will be removed. Does that mean I lose my get out of hell card? Like I thought when I prayed the prayer, it was in there. Like I got it. It does not mean damned to hell. No, don't, don't misunderstand that. Don't you know who God is? He's a loving God. But you'll be doomed to a life of fruitlessness and insignificance for that which really matters. No place of influence. If you don't love me and you don't love people, this is what Jesus says, I'm not hanging out with you. You'll be like the people of Israel, wandering the wilderness, not taking the promised land like they were intended. Listen, let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. You don't want that life. You don't want so much of Jesus that you're miserable in the world, but you got so much of the world that you're not stoked in Jesus. That's lame. Don't live that way. Live for Jesus. How do I do that? Love him. Love him, love him, love him, and love his people. How do I do that? Remember, repent, and repeat. And then this last section, this is where we'll close. Verse 7, we see the comfort. He says, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches, to everyone who is victorious, I'll give to the eat of the tree of life and the paradise of God. This is a comfort to anyone listening. What does this mean? David Guzik says, Jesus seems to speak of overcoming a coldness of heart and a lack of love marked by leaving their first love. The promise for those that are overcoming was a return to an Eden-like state, the place where God lives place of restoration. This was meant first in the eternal sense. Making it to heaven, which is no small promise to a church threatened with the removal of Jesus' presence, he says. It's also meant in the sense of seeing the effects of the curse rolled back on our own lives through walking in Jesus' redeeming love. I have a dear friend that I grew up with that just came to know Jesus in the last couple of years. Um, interesting person, one of the most interesting humans I've ever met. His career is uh, very hard, the things that he's done. And I was watching a YouTube interview of him recently, and uh, at that point he wasn't loving and following Jesus, and so not every word was like the right words, you know what I mean by that? And so I texted him this week, said, hey man, just thinking and praying for you. And he goes, hey, thank you. You need to know that I, I gave my life to Jesus. 
I said, oh, that's awesome, bro. I'm so thankful for that. I just watched an interview of you recently, and he goes, man, I hate that. I wasted all these opportunities I had. And I said, you know, the Lord has a way of restoring the years that the locusts have eaten. The Lord has a way of bringing beauty for ashes. And here's what he's saying here. Listen, if you'll just do now what you're supposed to do, love me, love people. It's like you're going to experience that garden experience. God can restore. Just do the first works. Do the first works. You see, this morning, we learn that this church gets four gold stars, right? They're servants, they're sacrificial, they're steadfast, they stay separated, they're doctrinally pure. But sometimes there's a danger when your focus is only on doctrinal purity, it can make for a congregation that's cold. Charles Spurgeon said this, when love dies, orthodox doctrine becomes a corpse, a powerless formalism. Adhesion to the truth sours into bigotry when the sweetness and light of love to Jesus depart. It's not just about right doctrine. It's also about a delight in the heart for God and for people. We're to be known for our love. That's why the mission statement of this church is to love God, first and foremost. We won't be perfect. We won't bat a thousand. But by the grace of God, we want to just simply love him. And he goes, that's right. That's good. That's what we want. Here's where we'll close. Be honest for a moment. What are you known for? Is that what you want to be known for now? If not, why not? What do you need to do? Remember, repent, and repeat. Or be removed. That's the love of Jesus. It's honest. It's honest and it's helpful. You want a life that's fruitful. Stick and stay with Jesus. Love him and love his people. If, you, if you've been asleep this whole time, here's what I need you to do. Wake up, you're going to get the cliff notes of the sermon. Just love God and be nice to people. That's it. You can go now. Like, just keep doing that every single day. Live this day in light of that day. There it is. That's the sermon. You, you, you go, okay, and maybe I'll get those notes and highlight something, but that's the takeaway truth. Love God and love people. And if you don't know your way back, Remember the equation. Remember. Repent. Repeat.